My name is Pranav Bhattar. Volume. My task is to introduce our main speaker today, Dipesh Chakraborty. Many of you know him personally, and others know him by his considerable reputation. So I will not spend much time in elaborate introduction. Dipesh is the Quinton Distinguished Service Professor of History and South Asian Languages and Civilization at the University of Chicago. The most remarkable thing in my judgment about Dipesh's career is his versatility, apart from the depth of his scholarship. His educational background in Kolkata, some of you may be surprised to know, was in physics and business management. <laughs> then he moved to labor history, and then of course, famously, to subaltern history, post-colonial discourse, and then in recent years to discourse on environment and climate change. Another aspect of his versatility I might emphasize in this gathering is that he belongs to the vanishing generation of bilinguals <coughs> among Bengalis. He writes frequently both in English and in Bengali. In Bengali, he often writes for Anandabaza, Desh magazine, Anushtub magazine, and so on. On a personal note, actually, when my Bengali memoir came out in Kolkata, almost immediately, Deepesh graced me with a review in Desh. The other aspect of his versatile personality, I might add, is that today we have invited him to give a lecture, but if we had invited him to sing songs, <laughs> he could have enthralled you for hours. <laughs> or, if we invited him to perform as a stand-up comic, <laughs> he could have entertained you for hours. But we are serious people, <laughs> so we have invited him to give a lecture on Tagore in our time, and his. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Deepesh Chakravarti to the podium. Thank you. Um, so, Pranavda reminded me just as he was leaving the stage that I couldn't go on beyond half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> and when Munis wrote to me, uh, saying that it, I shouldn't be speaking for more than half an hour, I actually wrote back to him saying it's a very wise thing to do if you ask a Bengali intellectual to talk about Tagore, it's good to demand brevity. And, uh, so, because you know, I mean, um, thank you for all that, first of all, for the wonderfully personal introduction. And thank you, Munis, for the invitation to Punita and her colleagues for the organization that made it possible for me to be here. Um, yeah, so, um, it's very hard to. That's the thing to talk about Tagore because he's like the the water you drink, the land you walk on for a Bengali intellectual, or um, the sky you look at, um, the blood that courses through your veins, um, and therefore it's impossible to summarize his his place in the life of a Bengali intellectual. He's also, as the recitation of Where the Mind Is Without Fear showed absolutely relevant in our times when authoritarian regimes are actually trying to control us by spreading fear. And uh, when, as Pankaj Mishra wrote in today's New York Times, uh, Trump's dream is to have Modi's India uh, in, in this country. Uh, so his relevance is something in that context one doesn't have to establish. But I've been reading him recently, as Pramodha said, um, in the context of, of climate change, and uh, I even inflicted some of the stuff on Pranavda, who, by the way, is somebody I met first, uh, personally in 1990 or 89, when I was a visiting assistant professor here for a semester. And I have respected, and if I'm used the word, loved him ever since. 
Um, <coughs> so, reading um, Tagore as a humanist, and he was a humanist in his time, and there's a particular sense in which he is a humanist in our time, and but our time is a time when humanism is also in crisis. Um, and it's in crisis because of the things that humans have been doing uh, to the planet, to the earth. And um, so what I'll do, I have some slides to show. I'll just take five minutes leave from Tagore to describe you something about climate change so that you see the, the, the problem with humanism. And then read Tagore both on, on a register where he does seem problematic today, but also on a register where he still remains a resource, even in the crisis of, of, of humanism. So may I have the slides, please? The first one is a blank. May I go on to the next one? Okay. So that is, uh, of course, Tagore, but with one of his paintings. I'll have something to say about the painting of, of, of trees, but um, can I go on to the next slide, please? Okay. So I'll just quickly go through these slides. These are called, anybody who works on climate change knows these graphs, they're called great acceleration. And the graphs, and they basically show you what's been happening to the, uh, to the, to the world and the planet from about 1950. And if you see the, uh, so the yellow graphs are, uh, the orange graphs are all about what humans are doing. Transportation, telecommunication, water use, uh, uh, primary population, in my time, actually, Indian population has gone, grown more than four times. Uh, uh, so basically, if you look at the, the dotted vertical line, that's all going back to 1950. And you can see how exponentially it's grown. And if you actually re resolve the graph into finer detail, you'll see that actually it becomes steeper and steeper. Uh, OK, can I have the next slide, please? <clears throat> so that's still carrying on with uh, human activity. And the next one, please. Okay, and this, these blue graphs are basically showing most, most of them what the planet does in response. So that if the, if the orange graphs were about what we do, this actually shows what happens to shrimp, marine fish capture, stratotrophic ozone, carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas, methane, greenhouse gas. And there again you will see that the dotted line 1950 is really when it suddenly begins to accelerate. So people call it the period of great acceleration in world history. And also from this you realize that, <clears throat> that it's not just we do things, we do things to the planet, the planet responds to it through all its connected multifarious processes. One of the other things about human beings that we are now realizing is that human beings are the biggest, um, what technically you would call the geomorphological agent of the planet. In other words, we are the, the, the living things that have actually resurfaced, re uh, kind of organized or terraformed, as some, sometimes say, the, the surface of the planet, as well as uh, some, some parts of the surface of the seas for good. So, for people to say that we are, so we actually move more Earth around than all the rivers of the planet do, taken together. Um, so we are the biggest earth-moving agent, and uh, can I have the next slide, please? So this is actually a colleague, Sam, playing in a Hyde Park in, in my neighborhood, Park. And this caterpillar machine is ubiquitous in the world now. Wherever I go, I see them. You see them. When I was growing up in India, you wouldn't see them. I, I saw small women carrying basket loads of you know, cement or whatever, up, up bang, bamboo and scaffoldings. Now this child is growing up thinking that the machine has always existed as naturalized. And can I have the next slide, please? And you'll see how natural it is. This is a child playing with toy versions of the same machines. So I walked into my friend's home and said, uh, and said do you realize that these are the are Anthropocene toys? These are the toys which actually show that how naturalized our geomorphological agency has become. And uh, so uh, he said, don't name my child, but you can show the photos. <laughs> So I can't name the colleague or, or, or this child, and I love him when he was four. Now, what this means is that we have two visions of humans. One is the vision of human in which we talk about the kind of indignity and oppression that one group of humans meet out to another group of humans, whether on the question of immigration, race, gender, sexuality, whatever. And that's, that's 
we talk about the, the, the way that we have made the, the globe into a human inhabited planet. So, so there is a human centric understanding of the human. But alongside this, all we're also realizing when we look at this huge big way in which the planet responds, and by, when I say planet, the technical word should be Earth system. So since 83, when NASA convened the subcommittee on Earth system science, we know that this planet is a connected entity. And it has sort of almost system-like properties. So planet means Earth system. But the planet responds to it. And that the planet does things to which we are incidental, but on which we depend critically. So the fact is that we have an air in which the share of oxygen is just at a level where it's not so high that all the forests burn out. And it's not so low that all mammal, our kind of life, choke to death. And you know how long the, that has been maintained in the atmosphere in the zone, the oxygen level? 400 million years. So geologists talk about it as the modern atmosphere of the planet, but modern meaning 400 million years. <laughs> so you see, the, this is the atmosphere you are breathing. We critically depend on it, but it was not made with us in view. So when you think about the planet, it decenters us. It does not put, a, put us at the center of the story. We come far too late to be at the center of the story. But if you think about capitalism, our aspirations, then we what humans should do, peace in the world, United Nations, you put humans centrally at the heart of the story. So those are the two kinds of humanism, the human-centric humanism and the human decentered humanism. So the second version is sometimes called post-humanism. And when I read Tagore, I find elements of both. But before that, I should also say, uh, so look at these, these are sentences actually taken from a very well-known political theorist called Philip Pettit who is a theorist of republicanism. And if you look at his own writing, you the book from republicanism, you will see that he talks about two kinds of humans. One is humans added up, like as I see it, say, remembering my physics days, a sigma function, basically draw across all human activities. So he says, so this is his argument as to why we should be ecologically conscious. And his argument is that we are what we eat, Equally, we are what we breathe, what we breathe, we are what we smell, we are what we see, and here in touch. Remember, we do all of these things as individuals. I mean, our bodies are individuals, and these are all, so basically, if you think of humans this way, you're actually thinking of humans as the summation, the, 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 the sum of so many humans. So you say 7.5 billion, uh, 7 .5 billion people. Over Can we go on to the next slide, please? And then he has this sentence where he says, but we also live in physical, biological, and psychological continuity with other human beings, with other animal species, and with the larger physical system that comes to the consciousness. I emphasize the word continuity. And the continuity is not just psychological. He actually says physical, biological, which is true, the microbiome inside us. The zillions of microbes that are actually are inside your body, some of which even have a role in producing the chemicals that help you to feel the feelings that you have. So when you're listening to this wonderful Tagore song that uh, Nandi Yasmin sang for us, and feeling elevated, the, these microbes are at work in producing the chemicals that make you feel elevated. So sometimes the posthumanist Bruno Latour says jokingly, so when you crave chocolate, are you craving the chocolate? Or are you the microbiome? <laughs> the microbes craving the chocolate. Right? But the problem is, as Philip Perrin also would agree, this connected idea of human being is not something we can politicize. Our political institutions are totally based on that human-centered <coughs> idea of humanity. And the place, so when I read Tagore, and I'm just sharing with you two, two Tagore pieces, one is, uh, and I'll have to summarize it brutally, one is if you go back and read Tagore on uh, religion of man, which are actually lectures he gave in Oxford, 1931, I think, and they got published in 1933, you will find the first kind of humanism, human-centered humanism. So Tagore has this argument why humans are exceptional. And his argument begins, uh, just a three-step three argument, where he begins by saying, well, think of all the vertebrate animals. The most rational thing for them is to be four-footed. Because then it's easier to carry the, um, the, the weight of the vertebra and, and the huge big head sort of put on it. And if, he said, if humans were rational, they wouldn't have been bipedal. Which is true, a lot of our backpack problems, uh, women giving birth to uh, babies, you know, they all come from these problems of 
the relationship between the pelvis and the and the and the and the vertebrae and the amount of weight the vertebrae has to carry. If we distributed it over four legs, would have been better. And Tagore understands that. <laughs> but, they, but he said, but look at humans. The, there was a divine constitution that vertebra, vertebral, vertebral animals should be four-footed, and, and humans contested that. So he says, you know, they were always throwing amendments to divine constitutions. <laughs> so he was using bipedalism as an argument for human exceptionalism. Except that his history of bipedalism is wrong. And maybe that was what he was reading. Today we know that bipedalism, even there were pro, proto-human apes that were bipedal. So bipedalism actually goes back 5.5 5 million years or something. Even further, Tagore assumed that bipedalism was homo sapiens. And from then that he argues that when humans therefore could stand up, the human could see that he's at the center of everything. So human centeredness was absolutely justified. And therefore he said, and what humans could do standing up, because they could, they could take in the whole. So the human was at the center of the whole, but the human could see the whole. Unlike, unlike your dog, which is just sniffing around looking at the grass and nothing else. So therefore he used as a poet, he used this uh, metaphor of having a vertebra and, and bipedal as an argument for putting humans at the center of the thing. And that's why he says, I'm Manushe I'll never lose my faith in man. But that man was the human of human exceptionalism. But then there's this other Tagore, and I want to speak a little bit about the can, can we go back? Uh, so, um, so, you know, um, Tagore was lampooned at the end of the 19th century by many, many magazines. And among them was a magazine called Shahito Literature, which was edited by a man called Shurir Shamachuti, who was himself uh, the, a grand, grandson of Gita Shankar. But Tagore was hated for all kinds of interesting reasons, because Tagore introduced completely new kind of poetry in Bangla literature. And one of Tagore's uh, devotees, uh, Ajit Chakraborty, published an excerpt from a letter from Tim, by Tagore that he had written uh, in the 1890s. And that came out in a journal called Bongo Bani. And it caused no end of mirth in the Shahito magazine. So they are actually editors, look at this poet, what he says. And this is what Tagore had said. This was the offending sentence in the eyes of the editor of uh, Shaito, mm. that there was a day when I grew into a leafy tree on a young and moist earth bathed in seawater. So Tagore was claiming that he was a leafy tree once. Mm. And then it caused so much ridicule that when his letters were being put together and he appointed a gentleman he really respected and, and, and loved, Ramindra Shundra Tribhidi, who was a popularizer of science, Ramindra Shundra Tribhidi thought that this sentence should be taken out. Why expose the poet to more doses of ridicule? <laughs> And Tagore wrote a letter protesting. And I'm going to take you through that letter, parts of the letter he wrote to Trivedi protesting against the excision of, or Trivedi's desire to excise this sentence. Okay, can we go? Okay. So here is Tagore. And let me read it to you. You have raised the editorial axe against my memories of having been once a tree. But this action of yours is not like the pruning of unnecessary branches. It is striking at the root of my life. <laughs> because this is my inmost realization. Without my life, within my life, there is a secret memory of the life of trees. I can acknowledge it only because I'm a human being today. There's a very interesting philosophical proposition underneath all this. Uh, and but we can go to it. In, okay, next slide, please. And then he says, why only trees? Within me are deposited memories of the entire material world. All the vibrations of the universe bring thrills of kinship to my entire body. The silent and ancient exuberance of trees and creepers have found today a language in my life. Why else would I feel called upon to celebrate the spring right now when budding mangoes on trees seem to be intoxicated with a joyous spirit? Why would you not let me express the tremendous sense of joy that comes from water, land, trees, and birds that are coursing, that is coursing through me? Why? Lest people should make fun of me? He yes, asked, because he'd been made fun of. Next slide, please. Whenever at auspicious moments, this is 1912 when he's writing the letter, whenever at auspicious moments the realization that I'm here together with the sun, the moon, the stars, and the land, rocks and water. Whenever that realization rings out in my mind with the clarity of a musical note, my body and mind experience the intimate thrills of a vast experience, existence. This is not me poeticizing. 
This is my nature speaking. It is out of this nature that I have written poems, songs and stories. I do not feel the slightest bit of shame about this. It is because I am a human being that the entire truth of the non-living and the living find itself in a state of completion in my existence. Now, this is a very Heideggerian strain. I don't think Tagore was reading Heidegger, but Heidegger's thoughts were there. Heidegger was saying, there was of course life on this planet before humans came, but it's only when an animal came that had language. That the question of what does it mean to exist could be vouchsafed to somebody. So in this Heideggerian philosophy, it was as if the history of life was waiting for an animal to come that had language so that it can ask, what does it mean to exist? And Tagore is similarly saying, it's only because I'm human that I can say this. This still is putting humans centrally. It's still an argument about human exceptionalism. But the letter surprised me as I was reading on. Yes, please. Let me have the text. Okay. And then he says, this is the critical. The waves in my bloodstream dance to the rhythm of the waves in the sea. But the waves of the sea cannot recognize me. The joys of my life blend in with those of the trees, but the trees do not know me. They do not carry my memory, as I do of them. But what is there to laugh at in all this? Now this is again, here actually, he, now he's introducing a very interesting relationship. It's not the argument about I'm, because only because I'm human that I can actually have this memory. He's actually saying, but they don't recognize me. They exist for their own purpose. And therefore this is where he's actually departing from the assumption that underneath, that underlies so much of capitalism and our, our love of life, our very human love of life, that the world exists only for us. The world doesn't. We are a minority form of life. The bulk of life actually on this planet, both by weight and by numbers, is microbial. Without the microbes having been first there, there wouldn't have been any life like us. And this understanding that there is a the world is for us in a sense, and the world is not for us, in a sense. We are here using it. I see in this letter both of these positions present, so I can actually rescue Tagore from the charge that I was making, that he's only talking about human exceptionalism. So I was, as a Tagore Vokto, I was delighted to be able to rescue my, uh, my completely adored person. So uh, can we then go back to the slide of Tagore's painting? It's, so let me end with this slide. So you know, if you think about uh, Tagore's paintings, and a lot of people have pointed out that Tagore's paintings were informed by a certain kind of primitivism. And there's been books written on this, articles written on this. Um, and um, what I find fascinating is that when Tagore, if you listen to Tagore's songs carefully or his poetry, you will actually find that Tagore always individuates, particularly flower bearing trees or other trees in the world. He individuates them. <coughs> If you go to Shantiniketan, you will find out that there are also wildflowers that had no names in Bengali, and he had he loved naming flowers. And people will tell you this is a flower that Guru have called such this and this, so and so, such and such. But in the paintings, the, the trees are generic. You don't know what tree this is. And in that sense, it is precisely because, it, because his claim is not I was once a parul tree or a champa tree. Or a or a or a amkach or an amkach. His claim is I was once a leafy tree. And it's this generic sense of uh, other species that I think allows him to express poetically a desire for what I would call a planetary <coughs> existence. And because our political thinkers fail us, our institutions fail us in a moment when we scientifically and otherwise acknowledge that human beings are connected to other things. Philip Pett is that sentence, but our institutions since fail us. Our institutions are based on human exceptionalism. Our institutions are all based on the assumption that the planet exists for us. And, and on human, that human-centered humanism. It's because our institutions fail us. Our acknowledgement of our planetary bodies and our desire to live out planetary lives can only have a poetic appeal, a poetic expression. And I'll simply end by saying this, that you know, in 2016, uh, a low-caste young man who identified with Talits, called Rohit Vemula, took his life uh, in Hyderabad. 
protesting against the way he was treated by the authorities of his institution. He was an engineering student. In his suicide note, Vemula wrote, again, two conceptions. He wrote about two conceptions of being human. The first conception he was that he said, and that's, we all understand, he said, why can't I just be taken for a mind? Why is my body constantly being looked at as a Dalit body? Right? Now that's, you could say, is a liberal understanding of an unmarked body, or a, almost a mind without a body. Or, he said, or I want to be treated as something made up of glorious stardust. Now, stardust was not from the film magazine called Stardust. This one. <laughs> it occurred because Vemula was an avid reader of Carl Sagan. And he knew from reading Carl Sagan, and my colleague Neil Shubin has written very illuminating on this, that actually ancient dust, ancient particles from the universe and from the stars are present in all of us. And that's the truth of physics. And as a student of science, there was also this desire in him to be planetary. Not just to be treated as the exceptional human being who could be an unmarked body, but actually also to be recognized. So when I read Vimula, it sort of reminded me of this letter of Tagore. And I thought, for how long, across the separation of so many decades, the human recognition of human planetarity and the human desire to actually have institutions that recognize this planetarity have had to find expression only in poetic thought. Thank you so much.